the most fundamental part of your question is being six, why do we act that way? I'm saying, let's go to the Guru's definition of who is a Sikh, not the Sangat's definition of who is a Sikh, because the Sangat would tell you, oh yeah, you're a Sikh. Yeah, you've only done some of these. Okay, you're not as good as a Sikh as me, because I do five of these and you only do four of them. And you say, oh, I need to do that one as well. And the Guru's standing here quietly saying, why is nobody looking at the list that I've given you? As six, how can we behave in certain ways that seem to go against what the Guru is teaching? Because by saying that we are six doesn't make you a sick. We've got into the habit of thinking that being born into a family of six makes you a sick. Gurbani describes what a sick is in a lot of detail. Gurbani describes what a Gur Sikh is in a lot of detail. So just by saying that we are six, doesn't mean that the Guru is sitting there saying, yes, these are all my six. Maybe the Guru is sitting there and saying, none of these are my six, because I've defined what a Sikh is. So then what category do we fall under? We fall under the category of just being ordinary human beings. And as ordinary human beings, we've been programmed to act out of ego. And out of ego can we only be manipulative. Out of ego can we only act in greed, that we will do whatever it takes, even if it means the demise of somebody else. Out of ego only can we deceit and lie and cheat. And out of ego can we only pretend to everyone else, this is what I'm really like, but inside we know what we're really like. So just by being born into a sick family doesn't give you magical powers, doesn't give you a great ability all of a sudden to be able to act in a particular way. We're just human beings. And Gurbani is talking to human beings and teaching human beings, this is your problem. So we've fallen into a trap of thinking we're six, we shouldn't behave in this way. We should realize we are human beings and the Guru teaches us how to be a human being. The Guru teaches us what are the problems that come with being a human being and it applies to everyone. And these problems are greed, lust, anger, desires, attachments, self-importance. These are prevalent amongst all human beings. And because we don't address these things in our really, in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't actually do anything about these things. We just turn up to the Gurdwara and we listen to Kirtan and Katha and then we go home. We don't actually deal with the fact that I have an ego. I need to do something about that. I have anger. I have desires. I have selfish thoughts. I have thoughts that make me think that I am better than somebody else. You know, Kaam Krod Lob Mohankar, even those definitions need to be redefined. Not that they're incorrect in Gurbani, they're incorrect in our thinking. We just say the word Hankar and we say pride. How many people in this room can say, I'm a Hankari person? You can't. Most people will say, well, that's somebody else. Other people have pride. I don't have pride. But so let's change the definition. What does pride mean? Pride means self-importance or I'm right. Now how many, how many people in the Sangat can say that they have those thoughts? I'm right and they're wrong. That's hankar. And Guruji says that's what you need to deal with. I'm, I'm okay, you're wrong. See, if we say it's pride, you can say, oh, I don't have any pride. It doesn't apply to me. So all of that Gurmat, that's about how to deal with pride, we don't learn it. Do you see how much it changes just by changing the word? If we say hankar means self-importance, or a feeling that I'm better than anyone else, or I'm right and you're wrong, we all have that. And Guru says, Let's deal with that. That's not a good way to think that you're right and everyone else is wrong. That is hankar, isn't it? It's just a slight variation on the word. 
So we act out of these problems that we in reality don't face. In reality, we don't go to the Gurdwara, we don't go to the Gurmat class and we say, okay, everyone, today we're going to talk about your self-importance. Let's learn about it. This is what it looks like. These are the symptoms and these are the solutions. Go home and your homework is to work on these solutions. We don't do that. Why don't we do that? Why aren't we actually really learning what the Guru is teaching us and saying, how does it apply to me? So what we do is we say, I'm a Sikh. A Sikh means I go to the Gurdwara and I do the Sikh things. So I do the Matatek thing, I do the Langar thing, I do the covering my head thing, I do the standing up thing, I do the sitting down and listening thing, I sing the, the Kirtan and I read the prayers. So you've convinced yourself being a Sikh is doing these, these things. And the Guru is saying, no, being a Sikh is doing these things. And you say, no, that doesn't apply to me. That's for the other people. I just need to do these things. So we've been convinced that being a Sikh is about doing things. And the Guru is saying, no, it's about fixing these things. So whose definition of a Sikh are you taking? Do you see how I'm, 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 I'm stopping at the most fundamental part of your question? which is not why do we act the way we do. The most fundamental part of your question is, being six, why do we act that way? I'm saying, let's go to the Guru's definition of who is a Sikh, not the Sangat's definition of who is a Sikh, because the Sangat would tell you, oh yeah, you're a Sikh. Yeah, you've only done some of these. Okay, you're not as good as a Sikh as me, because I do five of these and you only do four of them. And you say, oh, I need to do that one as well. And the Guru standing here quietly saying, why is nobody looking at the list that I've given you? We're not doing that list. We're saying, Guruji, but I read your list every day. That's one of the things I need to do. It says, reads Guru's list. Kaam Krod Lo Mohankar. Done. We even stand in front and do a das, Guruji. Save me from Kaam Krod Lo Mohankar. I've done, I done another thing on that list. I did the das to save me from that list. But Guru's saying, no, I didn't just want you to read the list. You got to study it, you got to practice it, you got to teach yourself how to fix yourself, and then you got to help other people fix themselves. This is the definition of a Sikh, the list defined by the Guru. If you're anything like me, you'll find yourself getting stressed over the smallest things in life. Simple day-to-day -day things like the traffic or the weather or getting late or what someone else has said or done can completely change how you feel. So what do you do when you've heard well-being and spiritual wisdom but you're struggling to apply it to your life? For those of you who are new to this channel, my name is Satpal and here at Nanak Nam, we show you how you can dramatically improve your mental well-being and happiness using a wisdom of oneness known as Nam, as taught by the spiritual master, Guru Nanak. One of the things I've realized is that we get really comfortable with things staying the same. That's what we associate with peace, that everything goes according to plan. And when that doesn't happen, we use words like, this is going bad. And when something is good, that's when it's gone according to how you think it should have gone. The awakened people realize that there's no such thing as good or bad. Those are just labels we use to describe how something affects us. Think about it. Imagine it was your wedding day and it's been dry and no rain for many months. And so in your mind, you create an expectation that it's not going to rain. In fact, you might even pray that says, oh please universe, God, please make sure it doesn't rain on my wedding day. But a mile up the road, there's a farmer and he's looking up at the sky and he's praying, I hope it starts to rain. I hope it rains really soon. Now along comes your wedding day and sure enough on this day it rains. Now the question that you have to ask is, is the rain good or bad? And when you think about it, you realize the rain, the reality of what is happening in that moment is good for some and bad for others. 
or in reality. Some people will label that as good and some people will label it as bad. When we receive something, we think life is good. And when things get taken away, we think life is bad. And we never realize that both of these are necessary. So we need to start looking at life with a neutral mind. Think about what happens when someone pushes in front of you when you're waiting in a queue. What kind of thoughts come into your mind? Frustration, blame, anger. But the longer you keep those thoughts in your mind, the more tormented you're going to feel. And it's so important that you learn how to neutralize those reactive thoughts. A mantra that I love to use is, this moment is grace. Now, some would argue that you should always stand up for yourself. You should push back. And how do you know when to react and when not to react? Now, I'm not talking about what you should do. I'm talking about what you should feel like. And there's a big difference because let's say you do argue back. Have you ever noticed that when you've had an argument, long afterwards, that argument is still going on in your mind? So this is about how do you neutralize your thoughts so that you don't have prolonged periods of mental torment. You might think that it's easy to neutralize negative thoughts when small things happen. But what about the bigger problems in life? How do you deal with someone who you trust, who has betrayed you, who has been rude to you, who has offended you in some way? What do you do in those moments? One of the hardest lessons I've had to learn is that there's no bad people, only bad choices. And what that means is everyone is simply acting according to their conditioning, how the environment, how their circumstances have shaped and molded them to act in the way that they did with you. And when we think like that, it becomes easier not to judge another person not to blame another person and to even find it in your heart to forgive them. And so the question you want to ask yourself is how long do I want to carry this pain? You know, it reminds me of this story that there were two monks who were walking down a path and they had sworn to a vow of celibacy. In fact, they had taken a vow to never touch another woman. And when they were walking along this path, they saw an old lady standing by the edge of the river and they had to cross this river. The older and the wiser monk, he didn't even stop to ask any questions. He simply picked up that old lady, carried her on his back and they crossed over. Now about half an hour had passed and the younger, less experienced monk said, we've taken a vow to never even look at a woman, never touch a woman. Why did you pick that lady up? And the wise monk, the older monk said, when I saw that situation, I realized that I needed to help her. I carried that old lady across the river and I put her down. The question is, why are you still carrying her? And when I think about this story, it's a reminder to let go of the past. It's a reminder to not carry the traumas of the past even if the effects of the past may be being felt today. And the same is also true about blaming yourself. There are so many times that we carry around guilt and shame for something that we did in the past. But the truth is, you were only acting based on the knowledge that you had at that time. Think about it. Knowing what you know now, you wouldn't act in the same way. But back then, you acted in the best way you knew how. So what you have to look at is, how long do I want to carry that past? Because I can't change the past, but I can choose to see the past in a different way. I can choose to be happy now. I can choose to not carry the burden of those mistakes. So the key thing is don't hold on to the past. Embrace the idea that life is full of changes and surprises. And those who learn to live with the unexpected will live a far more peaceful and contented life. Some of us spend a lot of time hoping for a better future. 
and in this video, I'll be looking at how we create this negative habit of always wanting more and never being satisfied. So click here to watch this video next. There's a simple yet powerful way to instantly improve how you feel. Whenever you feel down or upset, thinking that life isn't going your way, understanding that when your expectations are different to the reality around you, that's when we experience disappointment and misery. For those of you who are new to this channel, my name is Satpal. And here at Nanak Nam, we show you how you can dramatically improve your mental well-being and happiness using a wisdom of oneness known as Nam, as taught by the spiritual master, Guru Nanak. Whenever I feel distressed or angry, it's usually when I'm fighting against the flow of life, when something is happening in the reality around me and I'm resisting it in some way. And because I'm starting to have these negative emotions, the first thing that I do is I start blaming. I blame everyone and everything for how I feel. And how I feel is usually someone else's fault, whether it's my boss or colleagues at work, whether it's my partner or my children. And I never really think about how my expectations are causing me to feel the way I feel. You know, the truth is that nobody can actually make you feel anything. How you react is completely based on how you view a person or a situation. I wonder if you've ever noticed that we spend a lot of our time in our minds and not actually living in reality. We spend so much of our day listening to the voice in our head, thinking, planning, scheming, coming up with ideas of how life should be and never really appreciating what is actually going on in life. Think about it. What do you call something that is in your head but not in the reality? I call it a fantasy and we spend most of our time living in this fantasy and we find ourselves being let down all the time. Not by what is actually happening in reality but by the fantasy of what we've created in our head. And when I feel like that I ask myself this question, what expectation did I create of this moment? What fantasy did I create of what the moment was going to be like? And usually we'll find that you're upset because you expected a certain outcome and life just delivered something else. So our emotions are really based not on life, but on our expectations. And whenever I become aware that I've created a fantasy, an unrealistic expectation of life, then all of a sudden it allows me to just let go because I'm no longer fighting the reality, I'm simply reminding myself to let go of the fantasy of what I thought this moment was going to be like, what I thought this person was going to be like, what I thought this situation was going to be like. I can let go of that fantasy and bring myself back into peace. I know what you might be thinking, does that mean that I should never make another plan? No, I don't think that's what I'm saying. Plans are actually really useful, but it's when we tie our happiness to an expectation that everything is going to go according to plan, that's when we're going to set ourselves up for misery. So instead, we need to learn how to live with unpredictability. Because you and I both know that life really is a roller coaster. Every day, things are going to happen that are totally unexpected. Situations are going to change. People are going to be different every day. And if we create a harmony with this unpredictability of life, if we're able to live with the reality of the moment, that's when we can bring ourselves back into peace. And the more that we can live in alignment with this roller coaster of life, the ups and the downs, the more content we'll be. So do yourself a favor. Try to live for the next 24 hours with no expectations. Decide that you're going to be happy with everything that happens no matter what. And don't forget to share this with someone who you think might need to hear this today. Sometimes it can be really difficult to let go. And in this next video, I'm going to show you how you can overcome some of the bigger problems in life 
and hurt that others have caused you. So watch this video next. Wow is his mantra. And he just uses that again and again. Wah, wah, wow. And everything that you look at, wow. And that brings you Everything is a miracle. Amazing everything. euphoric phase. When I focus on love and use a mantra that brings me back into that space of love and peace, I genuinely feel like I'm back home. I feel like that's just where I exist. Like I come from, from, a, from a place of love. More so for me personally than I do from a place of silence yeah. or an emptiness. Yeah. I come from a place of fullness rather than emptiness. There's yeah. a fullness to life where I can look at nature and just trees and birds and people. And, and I just feel this overwhelming emotion of love towards everything, not for individuals, but just for the whole system as it is for life as a whole. And that, that just seems to work really well for me. So one of the, 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 the mantras that we use in, in, in Guru Nanak's tradition, which is, which is the, the spiritual master of my tradition, he uses the word wow, which we call wahe. Wa. Wahe, yeah. And he goes, wow, wow is his mantra. And he just uses that again and again, wa, wa, wow. And everything that you look at, wow. And that brings everything you Everything is a miracle. Amazing everything. euphoric phase because every, everything that you look at brings you into that state of wonderment. I almost think of it like a baby just looking at life for the first mm -hmm. time, looking at the world and going, wow, look at this. And for, for people who've just looked at the same thing their whole life, they think, oh, that's just a tree. But if you can look at it with the, with the eyes of a baby, look at it with those fresh eyes, then everything and everyone has that element of wonderment and yeah. you can have that. And, and, and when we talk like that, I, I'm, I'm aware that it could sound quite wishy-washy. It could sound like for people, you know, what's he talking about? That's not real life, you know, get, get back into the real world. And I'm almost thinking it's the opposite. This actually feels like the real world. It this is. feels like the real space and the stuff that's going on in your head, that's not, that's, that's not the real world. Exactly. That's just a fantasy. That's just stories that's going on in your mind. If you can actually look at the real world and just look at it for what it is, it is beautiful. And that's not to say that there isn't difficulties and there aren't people who are gonna be really difficult and, and situations that are gonna challenge us, but there is beauty in so much. We can, I mean, I, I, I want people to get to a point where just breathing brings you into a state of wow. Yes. Just realize, if you just take a deep breath in and you realize, wow, I'm breathing. Like sometimes I've just, I've been blown away by what is breath? What, what is this? What is my body? Yeah. What is the stuff going on? I don't know if you've ever had, you almost have this kind of outer body experience. And I know children have this because you see babies doing this. They start to just look at <laughs> yes. the hand. Like, what like, is this? What is this? <laughs> wow. <laughs> children do this. And if yeah. you can do that as an adult to just take a moment to appreciate, what is this? Like, mm. it's not mine. I, did, I didn't create this body. Look at these legs, they move. And it sounds ridiculous. I, but the I, I mind is like, they're legs, duh. Yeah, they're know legs. <laughs> uh, your, mind's, your mind yeah. doesn't want to have that. Yeah. But if you can just overcome that and you experience mm. the wonderment of every moment, you'll be in such a great space within you. And if you can just practice being into that, getting back into that space, then the difficulties of life really don't come close yeah. to where you are. Exactly. They don't seem to be able to touch you because you're just in this amazing internal space. So let's understand that a little bit more. Rather than acknowledging that there is a body here, there are thoughts here, there are possessions here, the mind in its ignorance doesn't know and doesn't reflect on whose body is this? Whose mind is this? Whose environment is this? So the way to think about Maya is the ultimate deception, the delusion of matter itself, the delusion that the physical world is the only and ultimate reality. And this is the delusion that we are always in. It's as though our minds have been in a fog and we're not able to see very clearly. And in the ancient spiritual traditions of India, 
we've seen a very important analogy to try and describe what this looks like. And the analogy is that imagine you walk into a dark room and you see a snake in the corner and you jump and you're very scared and you're frightened. But as soon as you switch the light on, you realize that it's never been a snake. It wasn't a snake at all. In fact, it was just a rope that was coiled up. And this analogy of seeing a snake when really it was a rope is something that the spiritual masters have used to try and show you that just as when you're in a dark room and you see a rope, but your mind projects the idea that there's a snake there, in the same way, our mind projects the idea of ourselves. Your mind sees one thing and assumes it's something else. And you think that you are an individual. Rather than looking at what you really are, the mind projects the illusion of me onto the body. Me being the snake, the individual, as the owner of this body. The mind projects this idea that I am a real thing. So let's understand that a little bit more. Rather than acknowledging that there is a body here, there are thoughts here, there are possessions here, the mind in its ignorance doesn't know and doesn't reflect on whose body is this? Whose mind is this? Whose environment is this? The mind in its ignorance without knowing comes up with the conclusion that there is a voice in this head, so the voice in the head must be the owner of this body. There is a voice in this mind, and so everything that it says, it must be the creator of those thoughts. Every thought that comes into the mind, the voice inside my head must be the creator of those thoughts. The spiritual masters are simply those who have gone in and introspected. And it's very important that we understand that when we talk about spiritual leaders, masters, meditators, mindfulness experts, we're not talking about some people who are believing in something mystical. They don't just put their faith in some imaginary ideas of oneness. In the old days, spirituality and science was essentially the same thing. The spiritual masters were the scientists, but what they did more than anything else is rather than just observing the external world without interfering with it, which is the way of science at the moment, what they did is they also observed themselves. They went in and applied the same scientific method of observing things and rationally recording them down and checking with their peers to make sure that what I'm observing is also what you can observe when you go within yourself. They used a very scientific method, but not to observe the world, but to observe themselves. And when they went within themselves, the big question that they asked themselves is, okay, I think there is a me. Let me go find that me. Where is that me? And the deeper they looked within themselves, they realized there is no me. The me cannot be found. It is a delusion. It is something that appears from the mind. The mind projects the idea of me. But when we look within ourselves, there is nothing tangible that we can find. There is no creator of thoughts. There is no thinker within myself. There is no me. And so this is such an important idea. And when they came out of that, they realized we've all been deluded. Every single human being believes that there is a me within themselves. It's like they've been drugged. And so the mind is this snake. The mind is the illusion of the snake when really all there is is a rope itself. If somebody was to ask, well, what's the purpose of mm, exercise? Absolutely. It's almost such an obvious answer that yeah. you wouldn't even ask that question. Mm. We almost need to start talking about meditation in that same way. Absolutely. Which is, it's yeah. such an obvious benefit. Mm.
people are just confused when they hear the word meditation and they just think that it's something new like we're introducing something new into sikhi so like what would you say is the reason for someone to even try meditation whether it's it's sort of more um generally uh, tried and tested meditation techniques or whether it's specifically namsimran like what are you trying to achieve why can't you just go and read gurbani and just kind of learn the meanings of what it's saying and just understand this concept that there is a oneness and we're all connected mm. well, what's the what do you reckon the need is for actually okay, trying so, meditation i mean so for me personally the my perspective on why anyone would want to entertain or or should entertain meditation as part of their their sort of daily life is effectively if you want to understand your mind um and you want to understand yourself you need to observe your mind and you need to observe yourself that's a really interesting way of putting and it and so so for me meditation is a very broadly speaking again you know this umbrella term of meditation that we're currently using it is an approach of introspection and observing your mind and therefore hoping to learn more about yourself now why should that mean any anything to anyone why would one anyone want to learn about their mind well effectively once you start to look at your mind you start to see the triggers of what are healthy behaviors and perhaps unhealthy behaviors and what triggers and emotions and thought patterns lead to your suffering um or just not feeling great we don't have to use you know big lofty words about suffering but just not feeling great on a particular day um or just feeling a little bit better So to start with I mean putting all the, the very esoteric spirituality stuff aside it is just a process of like exercises you would advocate exercise to your parents and people who have never come across exercise as being this approach of, well if you apply some physical exertion it will be better for your health in the long run well likewise introspection um is a process of it can be quite difficult to start with but it is good for your mental and mental well-being in in the long run so so that's a that's a very effective starting point for me which doesn't have to do with any anything mystical or spiritual it's a very practical daily practice to just be slightly healthier and happier um but to to sort of again extend the the metaphor of exercises you know with with exercise you can do a light jog in the morning and be slightly healthier and happier or you can become an olympic athlete and mm. and be really sort of you know on your game with this particular form um and meditation is is likewise it depends how far you want your interest in the mind and your place in the world to take you and what we've seen from sikhi and other sages and other traditions as well that it can actually have some quite remarkable and transformative effects if you delve deeper and deeper and deeper um but i think it's it's it has practical useful and almost immediate benefits from anyone that actually wants to try it i really like that analogy of um looking at meditation as exercise and some of the questions just almost become irrelevant because if somebody was to ask well what's the purpose of mm, exercise absolutely. it's almost such an obvious answer that yeah. you wouldn't even ask that question mm. it's just so obvious well why of course do you want to do exercise because it's just good for you it's good for your health it's good for your your heart and your your muscles and it's good for you know burning fat and all those sorts of things and i think in the same way we almost need to start talking about meditation in that same way absolutely. which is it's yeah. such an obvious benefit mm. that it's good to do with sort of stress relief knowing your own mind understanding your reactions as as kind of kind of you said you know understanding why your emotions are are are, are kind of reacting in in a particular way and and almost just knowing who you are a little bit better mm, it's kind absolutely. of just going in t- and and searching who you are and i think that's a misconception that a lot of people make is that they already know who they are because they know their name they know their likes their dislikes they know their job they know all the thoughts that are inside their head but they don't necessarily understand why they react in a particular way um and what they can do when they're in those situations